Hello and welcome back to CS420, a course on game hacking. Last lecture we learned about static addresses, so this lecture will focus on dynamic addresses. To understand dynamic memory, we need to understand something called a pointer. So what is a pointer? Put in simplest terms, pointers are just one-way connections between objects. So last lecture I showed you this diagram. This is a fairly basic architecture for a game where the exe is loaded into virtual memory and it creates the world and the world loads the players and so on. The connections in this diagram are pointers. In fact, you can imagine that the user interface would also need a pointer to the player so that it can read the player's health. So the UI would have a pointer over to this object. And if the player's health was static, the pointer would actually point up here. Pointers are just the connections that allow objects to access each other. So let's look at a path like this one. Let's say we wanted to be able to reliably locate gold. And let's say the programmer stores gold in the inventory object under the player. So we have the XE world player inventory. Here's what this setup might look like in virtual memory. We have the EXE, which is pointing to the world, which is pointing to the player, which is pointing to the inventory. Now, before I move on, I wanna make a small detour because I think it will help with everyone's understanding of how pointers work. I assume many of you have heard of the term memory leak. A memory leak is when the programmer destroys a pointer but forgets to delete or deallocate the objects. So in this example, maybe the player went through a door and loaded a new map. We would normally expect the game to destroy the old map and load a new one, but in this case, the programmer made a mistake. In this example, the pointer was changed to point to the new world here, but the old objects weren't deallocated. So now we have these dead objects just sitting in memory. The old world, the old player, old inventory. This is known as a memory leak. And if the program keeps running for a long time, eventually the virtual memory gets littered with all of these dead objects. So in this diagram, all of these gray objects are objects the programmer forgot to delete. And the program is just eating up more and more RAM because it forgot to clean up after itself. And after all of the unallocated space gets filled up, the program runs out of memory and it crashes. Uh, hopefully this helps reinforce what we're about to learn. Anyhow, back to this diagram. We're trying to find gold and it's one, two, three pointers deep. So we can actually look at this in a different way. Here is a more technical view of what the path from the EXE to gold looks like. Here we have the loaded EXE and way over here we have the inventory object and gold inside of it. So in this example, the programmer made health static and the player position static since they are in the EXE and not the player object. And the health is a four byte integer most likely. So four bytes away, we have the next variable, which is the player X, which is a float, therefore also takes four bytes. So we have the Y position, another four bytes away. And four bytes away from that, we have the world pointer. Now this star notation is just notation for a pointer. Anytime you see the star, think pointer. A pointer is just a new data type on a 32 bit program. It takes up four bytes, and on a 64-bit program, a pointer is eight bytes. And what a pointer does is it stores the location of an object. So here it stores the location of this world object. Now, just to make sure we're on the same page, all of these are just blocks of data like we've seen before, except now we're looking at it in list form. So back to this diagram. One more thing to point out, that these addresses are relative addresses. Uh, meaning this exe can be loaded anywhere, right? This could be loaded at address 1000, therefore the player health would be at 1000, then this would be 1004, 1008, 1000 C, remember this is hex, and so on. These are just offsets, uh, hence the term relative address. Now let's look at this world object a little more closely. We have two values here. We have the map width and height, uh, both of which are probably ints or floats. Either way, they take up four bytes, so eight bytes in, we have this player pointer. And if we follow that, we get to the player object, which has some properties, say mana, whatever else, and then inventory pointer, and we follow that. And then somewhere down here, we eventually find our gold. Okay, so what, why is this important? This is important because we just discovered a reliable way to find our gold. It turns out that if we follow this path every time we launch the game, it will always lead to gold. 
Even though the world object might be in a different spot in memory, the player object might be in a different spot, the inventory, we can always start at the exe, go down to relative address C, right? Relative address C here, follow this pointer, go down eight, follow this pointer, go down four, follow this, go down eight. We can always follow these exact steps and no matter where this world object is, no matter where this player object is, no matter where this is, we will always be able to just go down the rabbit hole and find our gold. I'll show this with hacking tools soon, but for now we need to learn a little bit of notation. Let's start with an easy one. Here we have squally.exe plus four. So what this means is wherever the exe is loaded, go forward four bytes. So here we have the player x. So in other words, this is notation for the player's x position, just squally.exe plus four. Easy enough but it can get a little complicated with pointers, so let's learn that. Uh, let's learn the notation for gold. So we start off with the exe as normal. We go down C bytes, 12, and we follow it to the world object. Now the pointer is at squally.exe plus C, but we followed it. Now, when you follow a pointer, that's where you put brackets around the notation. So what these brackets mean is follow the pointer. So the world object, is at following the pointer of squally.exe plus c, right? Pointer is at squally.exe plus c, follow, you put brackets around it. Now we repeat this process again. We go down eight bytes and we follow. What that means is we add eight and because we followed, we put more brackets around it. And then we go down four to the inventory and we add four, put more brackets around it. And then we go down eight, and because we stopped here, we do not need another set of brackets. We didn't follow any pointers. We stopped eight down. So this complicated, messy uh, notation here describes how we find our gold. And it turns out you can punch this into Cheat Engine. In fact, Cheat Engine will help you find this. And every time you load up the game, this will reliably produce a gold variable that you can change every single time. So now that you know what pointers are, let's learn how to find them. So you fired up Squalor or Cheat Engine, use memory scanning to find the gold, and now you want to find a pointer path to that gold. Well, it turns out these tools make it easy. They have pointer scanners, which allow for Cheat Engine or Squalor to automatically find these pointer paths. But before I demonstrate how to use the tools, I want to get into the theory of how they actually work. So it turns out annoyingly, there's no easy way to backtrack from gold to the exe, right? You, you, all pointers need to start at the exe, right? Comes down here, goes to world, goes to player, goes to inventory. These are one way arrows, they're unidirectional. The inventory has no idea the player exists, the player has no idea the world exists, and the world has no idea that this exe exists. The arrows only flow downward. So it turns out the best way to think of this is as a graph problem, a directed graph problem. And there's an entire field of math and computer science called graph theory that studies these types of problems, which we can apply here. Unfortunately, the solution isn't very elegant. The way that Cheat Engine does this is by brute forcing every possible path. If you're trying to find a path from the exe to gold in the inventory object down here, uh, maybe Cheat Engine will go up to the sound system, up dead end, backtrack to the world, up to time map, dead end, It'll just keep trying everything until eventually it finds a path to the inventory. And ta-da, we found it. Uh, there is a small problem though. What if it took this path, right? It goes through the user interface, then it finds the player, and then the inventory. Uh, this would technically work, but the issue here is that what if there was a cutscene playing and they didn't load the user interface? All of a sudden, this path would break. So some paths are more resilient than others. So that's part of the technique of pointer scanning is finding a reliable path from a static base to a dynamic variable. Before we get to a real example, I wanna to quickly touch on DLLs or dynamically linked libraries. So I've mentioned that the EXE can create objects like the world and the user interface. Well, this isn't the only way to program a game. In some games, there can actually be other trees that start from DLLs. Now the main tree starts from the EXE, but the EXE can load up a DLL, which can then create its own objects the same way an EXE can, and DLLs are also static. 
So in this architecture, we have a physics DLL loaded alongside the EXE. In this case, the player's X and Y positions would actually be kept over here in a physics object from this DLL, and the player's health and mana would actually be kept in the original EXE. And there would need to be some level of interaction between these two trees to keep the information in sync. For example, the player object might be given a pointer to the corresponding physics object, and from a game hacker's perspective, everything is still the same. You still find the player's X and Y position through scanning, and the only difference is that when you run a pointer scan, the pointer path might trace up to the DLL. In fact, in this example, there are two answers. It'll trace up to the DLL and it will trace over to the EXE, and both are acceptable solutions. Both of those will work. And just to clarify, this is how it would look when laid out in virtual memory. The EXE gets loaded in as normal, and later the DLL gets loaded in, which could then create its own objects. And just like the EXE, it's very easy to locate where the DLLs are loaded because we can simply ask the operating system. And that's what tools like Cheat Engine and Squalor do. Here's a quick example from the game The Witcher 3, which is a fairly modern game at the time of recording this video. Alongside the EXE, there are all sorts of DLLs, like this one for physics here, and there's one for Steam here to allow Witcher to integrate with Steam, and there's, believe it or not, one for controlling hair. This one's made by NVIDIA to give a realistic hair appearance. So if you were to develop an anti-gravity hack for this game, there's a good chance that the pointers would trace back to one of these physics DLLs. And our tools will figure this out automatically. There's no added effort on our part. So now let's jump into how to do this with tools. So let's jump into that example from before where we had the player's X position and we had to teleport through that wall. Remember that the X position hack stopped working. Here I've gone ahead and found the X position again. So X position, right? If I change this to 600, I teleport, cool. And we want to be able to reliably edit the X position every time we restart the game. And that means finding a pointer. Now I've gone and done that already up here, but you can ignore this. We're gonna do it from scratch on this. So what we do is right click, pointer scan for this address. Defaults are fine. Um, there are videos on pointer scanning that might go more in depth on all of these features, but basically max level is how many uh, possible pointers deep can the pointer go. Uh, the, the lower this number, the faster the scan, but you might miss results. Uh, we're just gonna leave it at the default for now. So all of the defaults are fine. Hit okay. Uh, it'll ask you to save the results to a file. Just go ahead and do that. And we wait it out. Okay, it finished fairly quickly and it found a bunch of pointer paths. Now here's the thing. Some of these are not going to be reliable. And it turns out the best way to determine if a pointer path is reliable is just to restart the game. So I'm gonna restart the game. I'm gonna go ahead and launch it again. Okay, so we're back in. Everything is still open here. I'm gonna reattach this to the new version of Squally, keep everything. And now we have to do something super tedious. We would have to scan and find the player's X position all over again. Uh, I've gone ahead and made that easier by cheating a little bit here, but bear with me. So let's say we scan and we find the player's X position again. So X position again. And what we can do, see this old one is no longer valid. It's pointing to like not a number here because we restarted the game. The object got allocated to a new position. This is the new X address. So what we can do is go into this pointer scan window, go into pointer scanner, rescan memory, and say, actually, it should be pointing to this now. And what this will do is filter out any paths that stopped working. So now we're down to two, three, four, five, six or seven results. And a good rule of thumb is the shorter paths are often more reliable. So I'm gonna add these. There's still no guarantee that all of these will work forever, but these are probably very good. So now what we can do is just double click on all of them and that's been adding these to our list down here. And now we're gonna do something to test it out. We're gonna close out of the game, launch it yet again. And 
if what we did is correct, then all of these, or most of them, should be able to reliably find the X position of the player. And actually, I'm just going to boot into uh, a different, uh, into a save file, a different map here, see if these still work. Reattach this to the new version of Squally. And it looks like most of these work, all of them actually. So if I move around, you can see the value updating, change this to a different number, I'm teleporting around. And just like that, we found a reliable way to change our X position every time we restart the game. Now, one thing to note is that I didn't really go super deep into all of the tricks and caveats to pointer scanning. I recommend looking up videos on pointer scanning and kind of learning the ropes here. Some games are harder than others. Some games require more pointer depth. Some require tweaking the parameters in that pointer scan menu. Um, but usually you don't need to change anything and this is sufficient what you've seen here. Anyhow, thanks for watching. As usual, if you have questions or feedback, drop a comment below. Thank you.